Annyeong SAO. Welcome to Afternoon of Delight, where Leah, Megan, and Amy, romance novelists and your K romance guides. So grab some deck bokey and listen to your new favorite unease. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. As you might be able to hear, we are neither Amy, Leah, nor Megan on this podcast. And instead, they've left three of us guest hosts in charge. What were they thinking? So I don't know whether to be very excited or scared. We will see how it plays out. But let's all introduce ourselves for those who might not know us from previous guest host slots. I'm Sarah. I'm a British-born Chinese K-drama fan, and I blog reviews on www.kdramaslist.com, and I post on Instagram and Twitter at kdramathis. I'm a longtime fan of the show, a patron, and I've also guest hosted on previous podcasts like Hometown Cha Cha Cha, 2521, and Extraordinary Tiny Wu. So for this podcast i'm joined by another two guest hosts that were part of the extraordinary attorney woo podcast as well but part two section where they looked at how the drama handled autism so on that i myself and i introduced myself in this way in in extraordinary attorney woo part one which was our part of that i'm myself neurotypical but I'm part of a mixed neurotypical and neurodiverse family and consider myself an autism ally and which to me is meaning that I'm learning every single day how to be a better ally I recognize my own neurotypical and ableist biases and I connected with uh, our two guest hosts on Twitter and I loved their posts on Extraordinary Attorney Wu and found them really illuminating and was so stoked when they agreed to join the Nunas for a, a guest host podcast on Extraordinary Tony Wu. And it's been one of my favorite, and I'm not saying this, you know, to butter you guys up, but genuinely is one of my favorite podcasts to date because I learned lots and lots from you. And I was actually keen to learn more. I was sad that it was only an hour long and it finished for me, it finished early. So if anyone hasn't listened to it yet, I really encourage you guys to. So then after that, I said to them and the Nunes that I could easily, you know, talk more and listen more. And so then we thought, actually, let's do an extra pod on these topics. And we wanted to pick a topic on autistic coded K-drama characters. So here we are. And let's meet our other guests. So first of all, we've got Francisca. Hi, my name is Francisca. I'm ever so grateful that we're back here and doing another podcast on this. Like, I really, really, really enjoyed doing the one on Extraordinary Eternal Wu. It's so great of the afternoon as to give us this platform. So, yeah, I'm from Germany. I am on Twitter as Wandering Francie. I mainly tweet about, well, a little bit of autism, but mostly K-drama and uh, Ji Chang Wook. But, yeah, that's it, I think. Great. Thank you. And Jay? Hi there. Uh, I'm so glad to be back as well. Like this is just so much fun and it's a really good opportunity. And thanks so much, Afternoonas. This is awesome. Yeah, I'm Jay. I'm on Instagram and Twitter as Hallyu Library Bird, and I'll spell that out for you. And I won't go into the big discussion of what a library bird is. You can listen to the <laughs> <laughs> Extraordinary Attorney Woo podcast for the big discussion about library birds. But anyway, H A L L Y U. L-Y-R-E-B-I-R-D. And I basically like tweet and post about um, K-dramas, uh, C-dramas, K-pop. I'm seeing Stray Kids tonight. What? And, uh, <laughs> yes! Yes! <laughs> I'm so excited. You have no idea. It's going to be a very long day for me today because like, I'm going to go into the city and meet some friends and then the concert tonight. And so, I mean, so worth it. So, um, yeah. So, and also, like, I post um, a lot about autism as well. And just trying to kind of um, in in the mix of with, you know, the K-dramas and the K-pop and whatever is just try and like increase the understanding of it and just, you know, the acceptance thing. Because, I mean, the whole thing is just, you know, we need allies. We do need allies so much. And so, I mean, it's just a matter of just getting conversations going. And that's what I'm always looking to do. So, so thanks. Yay, wonderful. And Jay, could you remind us where you, you're based? Because we're, uh, we're transcontinental today. Absolutely. I am in Melbourne, Australia. You can tell by the accent, though, I'm like Canadian. So, I mean, I'm Aussie by citizenship now, but I'm originally from Canada. So in case you're wondering, like, what's up with her, her really non-existent <laughs> Aussie accent. <laughs> I just want to say thank you that it is not 
2 a.m. at the moment for me while we're doing this podcast. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Francisca joined at 2 a.m. to do the Attorney Wu podcast with the Nunes because I think Nunes themselves span like, you know, time zones in the States as well. So it was challenging, I think, to, for you guys to get a slot together where you could all join. So yeah, we're in the evening here in Europe. And obviously for Jay, it's the morning. So she's about to have her big, super exciting day. Today's topic that we're going to be talking to you guys about is autistic coded characters in K-drama. We were actually thinking when we started talking about this, there's actually so much to say. So we actually are planning more than just one pod on this. So this is, I'm going to call it a mini series because <laughs> we might end up with yet more, more episodes of this, but we're going to focus today's one on a recent drama that all three of us have watched, but the Nunes haven't covered, which is Love in Contract. It's a recent rom-com with Park Min Young. We're actually going to be mainly concentrating on the male lead character played by Go Kyung Pyo, who is Jong Ji Ho. But we really enjoyed it and we especially loved his character and we all think that he is autistic coded. So if you've not seen Loving Contract, we won't be giving away major plot spoilers and certainly won't be doing in the early sections. If we feel like we want to make a point that is then going to be a spoiler, we, we will warn you. But hopefully, even if you haven't seen this drama, we hope you'll find this topic interesting because I think there's a lot to unpack on this topic. As I said, I'm not the autistic one on this podcast, so I'm going to be the one mainly asking lots of questions of you two to kind of flesh out what this character is all about. Let's start off from the beginning. Love in Contract is a 2022 drama starring Park Min Young, our much-loved rom-com actress from dramas such as Healer and What's Wrong with Secretary Kim. She's joined by Go Kyung Pyo, whose most famous role is probably Sun Woo from Reply 1988. It's a rom-com with a darker edge than the posters and the drama's intro suggests, but an interesting drama nonetheless. Park Min Young plays Choi sang a master at contract marriages, where her cl- clients employ her to be the perfect wife. Go Kyung Pyo is Jung Ji Ho, a judge who has been using sang services for the last five years. When a new client, famous actor Kang Hae Jin, played by Kim Jae Young, also hires sang to be his pretend girlfriend, things start to change. The rest of this drama then goes on to deal with this sort of love triangle, though I don't personally think it is one, and the feelings that sang and Gio have come to develop for each other. Um, so this podcast is not a traditional deep dive of this drama, but we do talk about things we enjoyed in the drama and we summarise how we felt about it at the end. Enjoy! So what does autistic coded mean to both of you? Could you perhaps give us samples of ones from Western media that others might be more familiar with or what kind of characteristics come through for you? I think the first ones that comes to mind is The Fabulous Destiny of Amélie Poulain. And oh, it's a French yes. film. Oh, I haven't seen that. Okay, oh, really? Cool. No. It's from like 2001. Oh. Um, that's like the first one that comes to mind for me when, when I talk about autistic coded characters in Western media. But I mean, we don't want to go into these things too much, I think. For me, autistic coded is used for characters that aren't, in quotation marks, officially autistic. The writer or the director or whoever the media haven't said like, oh yeah, this isn't drama about an autistic character, he's autistic. No, no one in the drama says he's autistic or she's autistic. But you can still tell from the character traits they have, from the behavior they show and from, you know, what person they are. You can still tell. That's what, for me, autistic coded means. That's how I usually use that label. I think in terms of how I see autistic coded, it's basically that autistic people can see themselves in the character. They Mm. recognize and it resonates with them and that they see traits that are similar to things that they they do. Just ways that that the character moves about in like everyday life how they interact, how they're portrayed on screen or whatever, that it just really resonates and hits home and the, and the autistic person's, like, hey, wow, okay, I recognize this. This this is me yeah. up there. I can totally see this. It's also, as Francisca said, that it's never explicitly stated that the character is autistic. It's just they're, they're written in, in a certain way. And sometimes, I guess we can get into this when we discuss the pros and cons of, of doing autistic coded characters versus like explicitly stating they're autistic. Sometimes writers don't want to pigeonhole or sometimes they're also just, oh, I just want to write this quirky, fun character. And they pick a bunch of traits that autistic people are looking at it going like, hey, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. You know, this is me. I was just thinking also for Western ones. I mean, the one that comes to my mind the most is a series that I absolutely loved. It's a Scandi Noir, The Bridge. 
Yeah. And Saga Noren, she's been written in a way that she is very obviously autistic. And even though it's not explicitly stated in the series that she is, there's basically lots of hints given throughout, you know, when she's having discussions with people. And when you get into the later seasons, when her boss changes and stuff and her workplace gets really toxic, people are kind of like, wow, seriously, what is wrong with you? And she's always saying, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm just different. That's just who I am. It's interesting because Sophia Helene, who plays her, has said before in interviews that, like, even though it was never explicitly stated that the character is autistic, she always played her as if she was. That was her mindset and that she was always portraying the character as if she was autistic. And that was her understanding from from the beginning. I haven't rewatched the whole series. I think there's like four seasons or something in, in a while, but that was always one of the ones that really resonated with me and really stood out the most for me. I can totally see myself in this character. And it was just, it was really well done. There's obviously like a, a whole list. If you ever Google online autistic coded characters and a whole bunch of Western ones will come up, you'll get like Sheldon Cooper and you'll get Temperance from Bones and you'll get like a whole list of other characters that people have felt that they were autistic coded and get like a whole discussion going back and forth as the validity or whatever and stuff but it's interesting I was going to put one more thing on here before we go. I know there's some debate on autistic coding and that sometimes is just head cannons or wishful thinking. But I think it's really important to acknowledge that autistic people are seeing these traits represented in a certain way in characters and it resonates with them and it rings true and stuff. Not to just write it off as like wishful thinking or oh, you just want that character to be autistic. And it's like, no, it's totally valid. It's mm -hmm. their experience. And if they're seeing it and it resonates for them, then that's true. You know, it's completely valid. Yeah. And also it's very true to life that many autistic people people don't realize they're autistic right so they come late to life and realization of their own diagnosis and actually some never formally get diagnosed but they just recognize that actually this speaks to me and so I have a lot of I belong to a lot of Facebook groups for autistic families and I think there's like a real recognized trait of people looking at their children trying to understand their children more and in that process realizing actually they themselves are neurodiverse so I think also yeah. in, in having autistic coded characters, it's just because autism is now a better recognized, there is more diagnosis available, that there is still huge swathes of people that don't realize they are. That's partly because of this very stereotypical portrayal of autism. So if you don't fit that portrayal of autism, they think that, oh, well, I'm, I'm not, right, because I'm not this person. It's really important for me that we do this series and that people like online discuss autistic coded characters because it just diversifies this picture we have of autism in the media so much to talk about these characters that maybe haven't been written as autistic on purpose because yes. the writer didn't realize, yeah. but that are totally autistic. I think that's just so important exactly for those people who haven't been diagnosed who maybe feel a bit different you know who haven't had access to the resources or the community to realize oh this is why I'm different this is where I belong these are my people to like see those discussions see those characters on the media and have people point out look this is an autistic character if you do relate to this maybe check it out maybe have a look maybe there's more you relate to maybe you can find your people find your community Absolutely. Yeah. And actually, that leads me to what was my next question. During the time when the show was airing, there were some social media conversations I saw on whether or not Jung Ji Ho was autistic coded. And I think some people said that they didn't think he was. Uh, I saw some comments about how, oh, yeah, I have an autistic friend and his character doesn't give me the same feel as their friends are. And I just found it so, so distasteful to see. And I made this comment to you guys in the chat earlier that if she had replaced the word autistic with, say, Chinese, I don't think she'd have written this comment because I think it would rung alarm bells. You can't just go, oh, well, my friend's Chinese, so I know all about Chinese people. And I, <laughs> like, you know, but I could tell you whether this person's got Chinese characteristics or not. But I think with autism, it's almost like it's, it's okay to say, I totally understand uh, how an autistic character would be portrayed. And he, you know, this person doesn't feel autistic to me. So do you feel like this is a common phenomenon for, for those people that are not autistic to speak about autistic people? And, and how does this make you feel? I think it's a very, very common thing. I mean, you see it on social media all the time. You see it in articles. There was recently something that caused a lot of upset on Twitter because studies are being done by researchers that are not autistic, that haven't consulted autistic people, that are, have just like happened completely without the involvement of autistic people, but they have such a huge impact on autistic people's lives, on the understanding of autism, on the diagnosis of, of everything surrounding autism. And there's just so much done that doesn't involve autistic people in research, in everything, in decision making. And it's quite upsetting, really, yes. because 
it's just all people without lived experience and by not involving autistic people it's kind of disrespectful in a way as yeah. if we're not human yeah. as if we're not um adults as if we're not i don't know capable people in some sort of way i don't know no um, i com- i completely agree with you and actually i would go as further as to say that that is actually almost a deliberate act right because it's actually about saying it's about othering people because if you look at that history of asperger's themselves and the whole nazi related history of of how autism and the kind of theories on autism and the, the characters that were involved i think it's actually a deliberate act right to to other autistic people and say that they are not the same as us and they Therefore, we don't need to take their opinions into account because they are not human like others are. It's only in discovering some of that kind of history that it's just realised how much of the current modern day diagnostic tools and how the medical profession thinks about autism is still so heavily based and influenced by all of that early thought. And it's really frightening, really frightening. Jay, what do you think? I absolutely agree with everything that you both said. You really hit the nail on the head. I was just going to add as well, when people have this idea of you're nothing like my friend who's autistic or whatever, I mean, we always repeat as well that first of all, it's a spectrum, right? And it also presents differently in everyone. And I mean, there's obviously like a core set of traits and things that they look for, like in you know the DSM when you get diagnosed. But if people are like, oh, well, I have this friend who's autistic and you're nothing like them, you're first of all, denying the person who's in front of you. But also it's just such a stereotypical limited view. And it's, it's really unfortunate. I mean, because everybody is, is so different. And two of us in this house who are autistic, and it's just, although we're similar in many ways, we're also very different. And it's also, it, you know, it would be a disservice to each of us to say like, oh, you're nothing like, you know, your daughter, or she's nothing like me or whatever. And it denies who we are. And it denies our very humanness, as you were saying, like who we are as people. It really bothers me as well when it extends to you know, the medical profession. And as we're saying, this whole thorny path with assessments and diagnostics, and just like for every psychologist or psychiatrist or whoever is doing assessments, who's, you know, who's kind of knowledgeable and on board and kind of like has a a wider understanding of autism. There's also so many that are still really almost decades behind in their views. And just as a personal story, when I was diagnosed with the clinician I was seeing, ironically, for like anxiety and depression, but he was kind of like, you're so obviously autistic. This is just not even a question. But when we were talking about it later, he said that he had colleagues who, if they were assessing me, one would say, definitely you are. And another would say, there's absolutely no way you're not. So this is just a thorny issue, right? And you see this on Twitter so many times as well, where autistic adults who are trying to seek formal diagnosis and trying to go through the assessment process are being turned away by narrow-minded clinicians who are kind of like, no, you don't tick the box because of my narrow definition of how autism presents in adults. And so you're not like, it's so unfortunate and it's, it's really problematic. I mean, this is what happens when working with these kind of like really fixed, rigid ideas of what autism is, how autism presents and these kind of stereotypes. If anything, if more discussions like this and more ways of looking at how different we all are will just hopefully help this. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. Right. So let's deep dive Jung Ji Ho. So Francesca, when did you first think that Jung Ji Ho was autistic coded? Was it obvious to you from the get go? Or was there a specific character trait that made you think, ah, like he could be autistic? I was thinking about this earlier um, when I looked at the question and I actually think I got spoiled on this one on um, social media before uh. I even started the drama. <laughs> <laughs> Because the dramas, when they usually air, I'm still at work, so I often like see comments on Twitter before I get you know, manage to get home and actually watch it. But yeah, aside from that, I think even if no one had told me, I would have noticed within the first five minutes or something like that, the first few episodes are just full of comments being made about his behavior, about his character. It's actually hard to believe that the writer didn't know because mm-hmm. they're just saying so many things. He's described as a bit special, as frighteningly quiet. He's like incredibly blunt. There's this one scene in the restaurant where he like eats the soup and he's researching <laughs> the recipe on his phone. The owner of the restaurant comes over. Oh my God, do you love the soup? Do you want the recipe? Do you want to like make it at home because so good? And he just says, oh, well, no, the taste of something, something is way too strong in this soup. And I guess the ingredients might be fresh, but I'm just looking how I can make this better at home. It's <laughs> <laughs> just like such a very stereotypically autistic thing to think of someone as very blunt and not very polite. But yeah, it's just, it nailed it in this little scene for me. But I mean, there's so much. There's the conversation training he attends. 
his boss keeps commenting on his social skills and how they're like a hot topic at court how his job is actually in danger because he's so asocial and he doesn't like interact with his colleagues and things like that but I mean the most striking things actually in the first few episodes are when he himself says things like people get annoyed usually when he speaks yeah he doesn't Hmm. yeah or he says that it often goes wrong when he says something and he doesn't really intend it but somehow he upsets people and so again he doesn't speak very much I think those were like the most striking thing from the first three episodes. Yes, I totally agree. I think he has a line, doesn't he? Something like he's learned that silence is the best way to either not reveal too much about themselves or just not upset other people. So he's yeah, yeah, yeah he's yeah. chosen that uh, as being the safe way or the safe yeah. path to get through his yeah. uh, his his life and his career. Uh, and yeah. what about you, Jay? Did you think this when you watched the drama too? <laughs> You made most of my points already. I was just going to say that it was like Francisca that recommended it to me. So, I mean, I suppose it was spoiled a bit. And then she was like, you know, check out this character. He's autistic coded and have a look and let me know what you think. It was funny because I think going in, I expected it to be a little bit subtler than what it was. Like I was kind of used to maybe like autistic coding in some ways, in some dramas being like really subtly done. But then... I was watching this and I was like, wow, there's so much in there. And to actually not say blatantly that he's autistic, but just everything you're mentioning with the painfully honest and blunt and all the situations you get to the restaurant. The one with the cats in the street, which was hilarious, oh, yeah. where, you know, where the woman's like, you must love cats. And he's like, no, not really. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he's like... <laughs> Re- trying to rescue these cats and then at the end like there's you know the, the, the woman swearing at him and you know yelling at him because she's like what is wrong with you you know and he's like go, go wash your hands they have parasites and um, it was just... <laughs> and you know just all of that the, the, the whole issue with his work colleagues and his boss and everything I mean like it was just it was really yeah not subtle to me it was just as clear as day I think I was for me like the genius of this drama was taking some of those quite uh, typical traits, and because I like I, I flat out I will say he is the favorite thing for me about this show, and I completely fell for him as a character. Like I love Jung Ji Ho, uh, mm-hmm. I love his earnest lust. I love that he's he's basically adorable, right? He is just so <laughs> adoringly a, a dork, and I love that they use some of those traits and kind of took them all the way through the show. So he stays who he is, right? He's not changing himself, but you come to grow to learn to love him and his traits, and I think they do that really, really well. So, for example, the literal thing, and I'm not spoiling this, but later on in the show when they're on the phone to each other, they're actually in that first flush of romance, you know, when you're like, no, you put the phone on the phone, no, you put down the phone, like you keep wanting to see each other. But anyway, he he rings her, and he's only literally just seen her, but then he rings and he, uh, no, she rings him, sorry, even though they've only just literally said goodbye. And then she said, oh, I was just ringing you to check you got home safely. And he literally just takes his, her at her word and just goes, yes, I did. Thank you very much. And puts the phone down. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, he's just so, like, oh, he's just so cute. So they took, you know, like so many of his autistic kind of traits from the beginning of the show, but they took it all the way through and made you fall for him even more. And I really thought that was, that was really well done for the writing mm. and which is why I agree with you Francesca I don't I don't think they unwittedly created an autistic character I think I very much think that this was deliberately autistically coded and the genius of what they did with his character was to make him so adorable and so lovable with it but for, for one of me so my one of my ones that I would have said to answer this question would which is a bit sadder I think actually is that I think there are lots of elements where he assumes the issues with his social communication with his colleagues not liking him with his boss not being happy with him all lie with him and his social skills are his fault he is to blame he's the one that's wrong it's him that has to adapt it's not the rest of society or his colleagues or his boss you know it's all on him and I don't know that the drama really goes into this um very deeply or anything but it definitely spoke to me in terms of the autistic experience of, of what it's like to try and navigate yourself through a world that is overwhelmingly ne- neurotypical uh that you always feel like it's it's you that has to do all the changing hmm. I totally agree that resonated with me a lot too that's definitely how I feel a lot of the time yeah and so leading on from that, we talked before in the Extraordinary Tony Wu podcast about how one of the kind of the worst traits of living in this or an overwhelmingly neurotypical society is this desire to fix autistic people and normalize yeah. them to act like neurotypical people. And do you see that in this drama? This is kind of getting on to 
the bit with the boss and with the counselor and, and everything. I mean, the whole idea of you need social skills training and the boss always pushing him to socialize more and to, you know, make more of an effort. This is holding you back from promotion. This is holding you back from your career. It's always on him that something flawed and wrong and that it has to be fixed. You know, he needs to change who he is and he needs to change himself in order to be acceptable to the people around him. And that's really problematic. Yeah, I really didn't like the boss character. He's portrayed as the person who looks out for him and who's like his only ally at the court and who kind of like supports him, who's like almost like a fatherly figure. But actually, I found him in his language quite abusive. Mm. He says mm. things like, are you a sociopath? And are you normal? He says, you've got a terrible personality. He's just, uh, I mean, I'm not saying that this, this is like an unusual behavior from someone of like his generation. Mm. But I don't think this ever gets addressed yeah. in in the drama. There's even like the, the scene in the hospital where he says some of these things. You've got a terrible personality. Maybe someone did want to kill you, you know, like, I mean, because you're such a terrible person. And I was surprised <laughs> at that. Yeah. But the whole scene is written with Jiho kind of laughing it off awkwardly and thanking him for being so concerned about him. And I just thought, what did I just watch? And it's just never really discussed that that is not okay behavior, that that is not supportive, that that's totally abusive. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. And actually, it's really interesting because I think for me, so there was shades of kind of the reason why I found the dad in Extraordinary Attorney Wu a bit problematic, even though he was portrayed, I think, to be a good dad. And, and in some ways he, he was. But there's also for me a slight intersection of culture. So Asian parents for me, and obviously I have, I have Asian parents. I am myself now an Asian parent and kind of like confronting my own childhood neuroses. <laughs> but I think there's an element of his behavior being seen as a good thing right so mm. caring for someone sometimes in an asian parent context is basically just telling them all the time what their faults are was i constantly told by my mum i was fat yes constantly was she also always flipping feeding me yes totally she was so there's like all of this like contradictory thing of being an asian parent but they're just they're so so blunt with your faults what you need to do to fix them and there's an element of well i'm responsible for you and you are responsible for us as a family, right? You represent us as a family. So you're not just in society as an individual, you're representing us as a family, but also you know, the things that are problematic in you reflect badly on your family and they reflect badly on your family that they haven't told you about them. So they haven't said to you, these are the things that you need to be fixed. And so the blame lies with their parents. And I think in some ways, what they're trying to portray with this character is that even though his boss is not his father, isn't it really cute that he kind of considers Jiho like his son, like so much like his son that he has this paternalistic attitude towards him that he wants to fix him so yeah I absolutely agree with you know all the points you're making I think that's why it's kind of been written like that because it appeals to Asian audiences that this mm -hmm. is the way you show love to someone by basically pointing yeah. out <laughs> everything that's wrong with them and telling yeah. them to fix it yeah yeah okay. absolutely that is really interesting. I didn't know that because, um, yeah, I don't have that cultural background. I just noticed there is this scene where I just thought it was really unhelpful. Obviously, in a lot of situations, it's just them two. So, you know, OK, fine. If you want to fix them and if you want to be blunt about these things, it's just between you guys, you know, like you're in the room together. There's no one listening in or something. No one else hears. But then there's this scene where the boss and some other judges they meet Jiho and sung who are just on their way to a date and the boss invites them to join them for a few drinks and then just makes all these comments about you know like there's like a quick silence and he's like oh yeah he isn't interested in other people he doesn't socialize that's why the silence just now is so awkward he just makes all these assumptions he doesn't even give Jiho the the opportunity to answer for himself and to say something and to maybe even you know I mean you don't know maybe even accept the invitation he immediately launches into this monologue about his social skills and how he never interacts with people and he just basically badmouths him in front of the other judges yeah. And I just thought, this is just unhelpful. You're making it worse right now. Because Songen is there. She could like fix the situation. And I mean, he knows that she usually fixes the situation. Yeah. But he kind of preempts all this. Doesn't even give him the chance to better his image and to be social and to participate in the situation. And I just thought that's so counterproductive. I think that's a really good point, definitely. Mm hmm. 
obviously we've got uh we talked a little bit about having autistic coded characters and jay you mentioned before that there are pros and cons to having an explicitly autistic person one that is autistic coded so what for you are some of those pros and cons i think there's a bit of a, a leeway and stuff here that you've written a character and they're autistic coded but they're not explicitly written as autistic and they're not out there as autistic first i think it gives a little bit of freedom in how they're portrayed in that i think people are when you say autistic as we mentioned people are expecting certain traits or stereotypes and they're expecting a character to act a certain way and be written a certain way and whereas if you never mention that but you put the traits in it gives a little bit more freedom in the portrayal and how they appear on screen and in how people interpret them as well because I mean then it leaves it open for interpretation and we've seen like online there's discussion of this character is or this isn't or whatever and so there's that freedom versus if you explicitly say the character is autistic I guess some of the cons well I'm interested to get your your viewpoints on this as well as to whether leaving a character as autistic coded but never actually saying they're autistic is is a good thing or does it disservice and I'm still kind of I mean honestly like I, I'm on the fence about this there's mm -hmm. sometimes where I'm kind of thinking that I don't mind autistic coding if it brings more awareness and discussion, like we said, of like, you know, exactly how autism present and autistic adults who perhaps are like on this path of discovering who they are and, and seeking assessment and everything, or just, you know, that realization. So, I mean, if we have autistic coded characters and it generates that awareness and that discussion, that's good. But at the same time, why can't we say they're autistic? Like, mm -hmm. why can't we just go out there and just say, yes, this is an autistic character and this is how it presents? So, I mean, honestly, I think some days I'm, no, I'm okay with this. This is good. And then other days, why can't we be more open about this? <laughs> yeah, and why yeah, can't yeah. we be more proud of this and just say like, this is an autistic character. So, I mean, it, it goes back and forth. So, <laughs> but I mean, I would say that sometimes I, you know, I mean, I'm still not sure about this, if this was actually intended or not. I, mm. I, I really can't tell. Maybe other people can. I, I want to give the writer the benefit of the doubt. And I'm sure there are a lot of dramas where we've got autistic coded characters where the writer potentially genuinely didn't realise. Mm. Yeah. They just wanted a sort of introverted, slightly awkward character or slightly quirky character or whatever. And they chose those traits and they didn't, you know, they've maybe never come into contact with autism or autistic people. I mean, that's totally possible, right? So, you know, I want to give people the benefit of the doubt that they actually didn't know and actually did it accidentally, so to say. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just about not being open about it, but it might just happen that they really didn't know. One of the drawbacks of it is, though, that we don't get fully developed autistic characters in a way. Mm, yeah. So certain things that an autistic person would experience in their daily life, if they don't contribute to the story, they would be left out if it's like not an explicit character. Like in Extraordinary Attorney Wu, we had those meltdowns and they weren't actually always essential to the story. They didn't further the plot or something like that. Yes, they were kind yeah. of an extra that made her like a more fully developed character. But if they had been left out, that would have been okay for the story. Mm. Whereas if it's like an autistic coded character and it's actually accidental, such things would not happen. Yes. So mm. one of the examples, I think, in Love and Contract with Ji Ho, there is this scene later on when Sung Eun tries to like encourage him to be more social and to be more attentive to others and like that. And they go to this golf match. Oh yeah. He's <laughs> super attentive to her. You know, he like there's like a ball that goes into a bush and he immediately runs after it before she can even get herself dirty or something like that. And he fishes it out of the bush and it, you know, he gives her things and he makes sure she's warm enough and all these things. And he's super, super attentive the whole time and he's super, super nice and everyone notices that he's being super social and super nice and super attentive. What was missing for me after that scene was I mean, obviously the experiences are very varied but for me this would have been exhausting mm. this would have depleted mm. my battery a lot so afterwards I would have had to recharge I would have had to have some downtime I would have had to be by myself not interact with people something like this in this k-drama wasn't portrayed it wouldn't like contribute to the story very much it wouldn't further the plot line but to show it would have made him a more fully developed autistic character if that makes sense yeah yeah it does yeah. And for me, actually, from that scene, similarly, he downs an entire drink that is really foul tasting, apparently. So like none of the other God, characters yeah. want to drink it. And I did think, you know, like, 
how common it is for autistic people to have sensory things around things that they eat and taste. I was thinking like, how likely is it that if all the other people around that room cannot handle the taste of this cup that he could, or maybe it was just like, okay, this is a sign of how much he adores her. Cause he's like, he's just yeah, going to die. I think that's what it was. Yeah. 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 <laughs> But just to just to flesh out your point a bit more, Francesca, just to make it obvious for, for people who maybe don't have that autistic experience, but that what you were talking about being really draining is effectively you're masking, right? You're pretending to be much more sociable than you are, you're pretending to perhaps be more like you're you're having to be aware of all of your interactions, all of the way that you're acting and 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 having to put a lot of energy into managing that, you know, constructively within the social rules, within the character that you're trying to to be. So all of that is very exhausting yeah it's basically i think the easiest way for who are not autistic to understand this is you just imagine you're an introvert and you're pretending to be an extrovert mm, yeah i think that's mm. what it is yeah or flips and like just, if you, you're like really exactly. really chatty and suddenly <laughs> suddenly you have to be super quiet and serious <laughs> <laughs> i was just going to add as well yeah like you we were saying about we wouldn't have seen the after effects of some of this stuff and a couple of the things that come to mind are the dinner party at his place the entertaining when yeah. you know his boss is like hey guess what you're hosting everybody and i mean wow <laughs> <laughs> like not not only you know are you as an autistic person all of a sudden forced to like have the entire troop of co-workers like all invade your personal space and sit there being really loud and noisy and talking and stuff all night but just just everything involved with that I mean like afterwards he would have been like okay that's it done ah. <laughs> uh, you know that's I can't handle anymore um, and then plus every time she cooked every oh, time oh god yes <laughs> And you can see him like just standing there in his kitchen and he's just, wow, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought that was really well done. She's like making this mess and he's just like, I have to stop her from cooking ever again. I cannot have this <laughs> mess in my house. Like, this is impossible. I do not want this. Why is she doing this to me? Like, I'd rather do anything else but have her cook in my house and make a mess like that. Yeah. <laughs> And I think it's almost like that example, if we just take that tangible example of the cooking, I think it's almost like a really good example of the double empathy problem we were talking about. And just the idea of she's, she's like, I am cooking for you. I'm showing you how much I love you. You're having a night off, my dear. Like, look at me creating for you. And I'm putting all of my heart into this. And it looks like, you know, his kitchen has been totally destroyed. And he's just standing there. And he's, you know, yes, but like, I would love it if you never cooked again. He's thinking, like, you know, like, this would be better for me if you actually, like, never cooked again. That is, a, that is a really good example of the double empathy problem. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So leading on from this, what do you think was, I mean, so obviously we talked earlier in the pod about how some people's views on social media was that this person was not autistic, you know, for various reasons, like they didn't feel autistic. So what for you felt like was a good non-stereotypical portrayal of his character? What, what, what character traits do you feel that you really enjoyed seeing? Because to you, they are part of being autistic, but maybe in the usual stereotypical way in media, autistic characters are not portrayed in this way. They did a really, really good job at having an arc for his personality without changing him. Mm. So mm. we started off with seeing him as the super, super unsocial, blunt person who doesn't care about anyone or anything who isn't interested in social relationships. But as we get to know him throughout the series, we notice actually a lot of his not having friends and not interacting with people is because he's had negative experiences, because he's felt that he annoyed people or that people misunderstood him. So he stopped trying. But then with Sangen, he gets a new chance. He opens up and he doesn't have these misunderstandings so much or she's patient enough to let him explain and to like figure out what he actually meant. Mm -hmm. And we start to see that actually he is quite caring. He likes to have this contact, maybe in a different way than other people and maybe less than other people, but he is interested in other people and he wants this relationship and he has feelings. There's this brilliant scene I love it where they're sitting over dinner and she laughs at something or he smiles or something and she's like oh my god you can smile I've never seen you smile <laughs> and he's like I'm a very smiley person if you look closely I smile all the time and he's got this 
face and he doesn't really doesn't smile when he says this and it's just so typical i think for this double empathy problem with autistics that our facial expressions just get misinterpreted yeah. like to him like he was feeling smiley he was feeling happy but yeah. it just didn't show the same way in his face and we just learned this throughout this drama. And I think it was done in a really lovely way to show that autistics aren't all just blunt, unsocial and unfeeling and don't want to interact with anyone. No, actually, there are, you know, like this is an example of an autistic person that does have loads of feelings. And there are lots of people like that. Yes. Um, lots of autistic people like that. Yes. Uh, Jay, what do you think? Overall, there's a lot that I really enjoyed about how he's portrayed and like the, the whole way that he was written i really kind of like the idea that he got to socialize in his own way and the fact that he had this contract going and that even though other people you know or neurotypical people might have looked at it and said well okay this is you know really strange or odd or like why would you why would you do this it was something that was meaningful to him and yeah. it was a way of him for connecting and for making friends and for whatever and the fact that as well that just like as a personal anecdote as well it kind of bothered me too like, with the boss and also with the counselor who were getting on his case for you know not having relationships and for like not having enough contacts and not having enough friends and not having enough you know like in their mind that you know he was deficient in some way for the way that he you know had relationships or interacted with people and that they saw that there's something flawed with him it just reminded me so much of when my daughter was in high school and i would get teachers that would talk to me during her during our parent teacher conferences and they would say things like, uh, like, it, you know, it troubles me that, you know, she's sitting alone on the bench reading and that she has no friends. Uh, and, you know, and they would always be putting their noses in like this is high school as well. And they, some of the teachers are like basically trying to do like high school version of play dates and set her up with like other students to try and, you know, you need to make friends. And it's funny because I talked to my daughter about it and I'd be like, you know, are, you know, are you are you lonely at school? And she's like, no, I'm just reading. <laughs> <laughs> you know and she wasn't she wasn't bothered yeah 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 she wasn't bothered and she had this still does have this amazing online social life so like most of her friends are online and she has this amazing social connection online and all of her friends are online and she's had friendships that have lasted you know like five six years now online and the fact that the teachers can't see that they can't because it's not apparent to them they just see yeah. the solitary kid on the bench and they're like you know oh i feel so sorry for her like maybe i'll set her up with this other person and maybe we'll you know they'll hit it off and of course they never did and they were kind of like wow <laughs> um and that just reminded me of this with his boss and the counselor being like oh you need to socialize more you need you know you're doing this wrong you need to have more friendships you need to like you know get in with your coworkers. you need to do this and it's kind of like you know like maybe you know the way that he's connecting and interacting is good for him and yeah. it works for him yeah you know and they're just yeah. viewing it through this lens and they have no idea yeah mm. actually those yeah. dinners with the uh, sangan she enjoyed them too yeah she, sometimes she was saying oh we didn't actually talk very much in all these years but actually she was also emphasizing how they were like a break for her from expectations from people and from society and things like that and how she just really enjoyed the quiet and being comfortable and silent with him and i just thought that was really really lovely yeah, I agree. I think I think for me, it was because you talked about acts of service being your love language, Francesca, and I think it's very much his love language. You know, all of the many things that he did throughout the drama to show that he cared for her, looking through security footage, like endless hours of it, and always knowing what her favourite meal was and cooking it for her at various points in the drama when he felt like she needed him to show her his love. And I think that often that's portrayed as not being very common that you know autistic people don't care about other people they don't empathize with other people and they won't understand what they need but actually you know we see throughout this drama he is really really oh how can I say like t attentive to her needs and what uh, you know some things she doesn't even directly tell him he's just noticed and then he just brings it on himself to to help her in in his own little quiet way and I thought that was really lovely I think that for me is something very autistic that I do and that I've seen in like other characters and other people, this duality between seemingly not caring and then being very attentive. 
Mm. So when you're not interested in people or you're not emotionally invested with them or they're not your friend, the colleague, he doesn't know anything about them. Yes. Even if they did something in front of him, he wouldn't notice <laughs> because he's so focused on doing his job or doing yeah. something else and his focus is somewhere else. But when he is interested in someone and when he is emotionally involved with someone, then his, that's where his focus is. And he can be like super extremely attentive and yeah. noticing details and remembering them all. And I think people sometimes struggle to put these two things together, but they can coexist in mm. people. Um, they, they see one and don't think the other exists. But yes. that's, that's not true. Yeah. Yeah. This duality. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But just because Jay was trying to sort her thoughts earlier, I also really, really liked about this drama because we were talking about what they did well with the autism portrayal and yes. what wasn't so stereotypical. I really, really liked, I mean, a judge isn't like a normal, normal job, but mm. usually the two stereotypes that we get for autistic characters are either they are super extremely intelligent or they can't manage their life by themselves. And I just really, really enjoyed that he was kind of like something in the middle. Mm. Like he was oh. fairly capable at managing his life and at going, at, at going through his life, but he wasn't necessarily like a super, super extremely intelligent. This is only 1% of all people in the world. Um, yeah, he, yeah, he didn't have a photographic memory of yeah, every page yeah, yeah. he's ever read or, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay, so have you guys got any other topics you want to cover or any final thoughts? There was this thing in the chat earlier that, that you said that I should definitely, a point I should definitely make on the, on the podcast. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I made a note of that. <laughs> and it leads us back to the question, was this character written autistic or was it not obviously there is no answer for this unless we get the writer on this podcast which surprise guest we have not no um, <laughs> <laughs> so i said earlier in the chat that actually i'm so torn whether this was accidental or not but i somehow feel that if he had been written as an autistic character on purpose that he would have been way more stereotypical than he was in the end. I mm. thought he was written in a very rounded and balanced way that you don't often see in purposefully autistically written characters. Yeah. If that makes sense. Mm. Mm. Because yeah. when people think like people who don't who haven't had much much contact with autistic people or who haven't read much about it, they obviously it's quite normal have this very stereotypical picture of what autism looks like in their head. So if a writer goes and says, oh, I want to write an autistic character, he's obviously, if he hasn't really read up about it, going to go to those stereotypes. And I just feel like this character, there's so much in there that isn't very stereotypical, but um, represents a lot of autistic people. I almost feel like either a writer who knows what he's doing and he knows a lot of autistic people, or he just took a person in his life that no one knows is autistic and kind of like based the role of that or something. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jay, did you have anything you want to, to raise? Um, you don't have to, no, by the I way, think... we can, we can cut this bit out. If you, if you don't, I don't want to put you on the spot. Out. It's just, it's just in case you had something I didn't want to, I wanted to make sure that you had the space to, to raise any final points. Um, yeah, no, I've, I think uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything I want to raise. It's probably you can tell. I'm so glad we're editing this. Um, <laughs> Just take your time. It's fine. <laughs> we're not too much time because you've got to go and see Stray Kids. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Hopefully, I'm not on here for like you know like ten hours. But anyway, um, here's like this whole like you know like autistic processing and working out. My brain's like mm, like the wheels are turning, and I'm kind of like, what are sentences? Um, <laughs> uh, when I'm put on the spot like this I often can't even think about the question anymore I just think about things like oh my god I need to like say something now oh my god what is the answer to this question oh my god everyone's going to get annoyed with me because I'm not actually answering the question and my brain just goes off and like thinks on this like completely different layer and doesn't even there's no capacity left to think about the actual question that I'm supposed to answer 
Yeah. And then it, it's so true. And I think it's kind of funny because, I mean, if we look at, I'll just go on with this. If we look at stere- like what people's stereotypes of autism are and about how the whole focus on being silent or, you know, situational mutism, but there's also this real propensity to just over talk when we're put on the spot or when we're, we're at this moment where someone's like, and what would you like to say? And it's like, oh God, just keep talking. Like, you know, if I just keep talking and I try to, you know, keep going with something, then there won't be this this dead silence and there won't be like all this, you know, focus on the fact that I'm not actually saying anything. And this is basically like me all through grad school and me all through uni was just, you know, whenever I ended up in seminars where the prof was like, and what would you like to add? And you're kind of like, oh, okay, I'll just go into some random 10 minute <laughs> explanation of some book, some book I read two weeks ago and maybe it'll sound passable and they'll think like, wow, she actually knows what's going on when actually I'm just kind of like, like, freaking out and like just talking. <laughs> Free paddling. <laughs> just for no reason. Honestly, um, I'm so I'm jealous just... of that. Because I, um, I was that yeah. person who did the selective mutism thing. When I'm put on the spot, I don't say anything. Mm. And then that that will be what I do for the next, I don't know, 10, 15, 20, whatever minutes, or how long ever the situation lasts. And that was always really bad in spontaneous exam situations when you're just called in front of the class and you're just like, oh my God, panic. And then you don't say anything. <laughs> To this day, I still don't know how I got through my master's defense because, you know, and I honestly think I've probably like blacked most of that out because I'm kind of like, it's probably best you don't remember. But honestly, (laughs) to like, you know, sit in front of a panel of, you know, like three professors who were grilling me for two hours on my thesis and me just having to like randomly answer, like, because I had no idea of what their questions would be either. And just to like answer. And I think I did a lot of just, you know, just grasp at straws and just start talking. And I mean, to this day, I still wonder whether, you know, they thought I really had it together and, you know, I was knowledgeable or they just passed me out of pity and were like, oh my gosh, (laughs) like, you know, poor you. Don't don't make her go through a defense again. Let's just pass her and get her through the program. Like, you know, it could have been either. Sounds Um, like my idea of a nightmare. It Yeah, it was terrible. It's probably a reason why, you know, I've conveniently forgotten most of it except you know like a couple of the points that the profs made that like, even you know 20 years later still stick in my mind is like are you really saying that <laughs> <laughs> you know like critiques of it and I'm like wow <laughs> autistic memory at work it's like yeah I don't remember a lot of the, most, the whole event but I do remember like you know some like critique somebody said and I'm like oh my gosh get real um okay anyway back to what I think you can like edit out that whole bit <laughs> no no Everyone. it's good it's good <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, I was just going to mention as well that like whether it was a disservice that there wasn't like, even just the slightest hint maybe of that a lot of his what he went through would have been more disabling right when we mentioned like the dinner party and we mentioned the stuff with him having to be sociable and the the golfing stuff and whatever like when we had like extraordinary attorney Wu and we could kind of see how daily life took a toll sometimes Mm -hmm. and you know just like if we could have you know just kind of like even moments where he like gets back to his place and he's kind of like okay, today was a lot, or like, this was a lot. And, you know, and I understand, like, we're saying that, you know, the fact that he wasn't explicitly stated as being autistic, so there probably wasn't a reason to put this in. But even, you know, like, they were working with the premise that he was introverted, and he was having difficulty with social situations, and that, you know, a lot of the stuff was difficult for him. If there was a moment where he could have gone back at the end of the day and just been like, wow, okay, I need to recoup from this. This is this has been difficult. This was a lot. You know, just a hint of, wow, this is a, a burden and this is a toll sometimes. And it's it's just, you know, part of everyday life. And so just just that aspect as well. So Yeah. Yeah. And actually to build on that point, because obviously this is a romance that, you know, even if you didn't show it, then potentially you could have it as a conversation, right? Like she wanted to uh, mm. you know, maybe she wanted to understand what it felt for him you know what what like yep. how much he struggles with being sociable when he is actually quite introverted and uh, and worries about saying the wrong thing to the wrong person at the wrong time because all his life he feels like he has been getting it wrong and that it's his mm. fault um so yeah it would have been good to 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 flesh that out so overall for those people who haven't watched this drama so outside of autistic coded or not would you recommend this drama as a, as good to watch uh-huh. Trick question. <laughs> yeah. So the Afternoon of the Light haven't done a podcast on this. The Debug podcast, they've done a really, really good episode on this. 
and on how this show defies trope and expectations but plays with them. Mm. So I w- would recommend this drama to people who like dramas that are a bit different that kind of surprise you Mm. that kind of play with your expectations and then do something completely different but I think for people who want like a traditional Park Min Young drama Mm. a very predictable very tropey very normal romance in a way I don't think it's for them (laughs) that's a good answer (laughs) what about you Jay it is no I agree I think I think she summed it up perfectly so yeah I mean I think I think for me there are flaws to this drama and there's things that I think tonally they they struggle with I think because like you said Francis it's not a a typical kind of Park Min Young in fact don't look at the um, poster and the fluffy pinkness and think right oh it's Park Min Young rom-com because it really really isn't but I think there's enough gems in this drama namely in Go Kyung Pyo's and brilliant I mean he's a brilliant comic actor and I've actually oh. I've only seen him in Reply 1988 before this but I thought his comic timing was brilliant I thought the physicality that he brought to this role which I didn't think we touched on as much oh. um, I thought was really really good I think he said so much with his body and with his yeah. eyes that were like he spoke volumes even when he wasn't speaking so I think like, one of the things we didn't touch on for example was that uh, you could tell with Park Mignon's character obviously she you know she does this as a job but she can flip her personalities and she can come up with words and lines really easily like her brain works really fast and he really struggles to keep up so you know there's a scene meets his boss by chance and his boss is, has given him tickets to see a show to go with somebody. And he sees that he's there alone. And he's really super disappointed in him that he's gone to this concert that he'd got these really VIP tickets for him to take somebody to, that he's there alone. And, and anyway, he'd actually given one of the tickets to to Sangun. And she turns up and then basically says, oh, yeah, I'm actually his wife. And he's just like blinking rapidly. You could see he's kind of <laughs> going into a cold sweat because he's yeah. like... I did not plan for this situation and now she's coming up with stuff and I'm having to catch up and then she's like told him that like this is a mini spoiler but she tells him that you know they actually got married and she was pregnant and he's just like what <laughs> like how do I even do this like she's just suddenly landed this like huge massive lie in front of my boss and he's like really struggling to get but he has no words of dialogue right that's all yeah. in his face it's all in his body reactions it's all in his physical I thought he was just genius in this role so I loved yeah. him for that I actually genuinely I think he, him alone is worth watching it but I also really love the character of Guang Nam who is a out out gay character although mm. I personally wish they'd gone a bit further with his arc but anyway at least he's out and uh, and yeah. has it and has a, and has an experience and we have a bit of a character arc for him but they also have him and Park Min Young you know they have such a you know a gay BFF relationship with each other I love it um so I think for me, those two it was alone were, were good for the drama good, worth watching what I really, really liked about this drama, I really like dramas about flawed people who are searching for love. And this mm. drama was full of them. I mean, we had the three leads. We had the gay boyfriend. They were all people who were struggling in life, who had trauma in their past that they were kind of trying to overcome. But they were all kind of like in their own way looking for love and they were all making decisions that were not good decisions I mean some were very good some were not so good just was so human and so relatable and to just like see them somehow succeed in the end maybe not have like a hundred percent overcome all their struggles but found some sort of happiness and some sort of peace with it with themselves with their struggles with their family with whatever I think yeah if people are into dramas that do that this is a very good drama for that Right, yeah. so we're going to leave it there today. I hope you guys have enjoyed our podcast and um, learnt some things. I've learnt tons. So thank you so much again for your time, Jay and Francisca, and sharing your experiences with us. Uh, I've definitely found it super illuminating. Uh, and we've actually got more to discuss. So what we hope to be doing is looking at potentially other autistic coded uh, characters, uh, most particular No Ji Uk. Uh, played by uh, Francisca's uh, favourite opera, <laughs> Ji Sang Up, in, uh, in Suspicious Partner. We're also looking at Semantic Error and possibly other dramas. So if you've got other dramas that you think you might want to hear, like you think, oh, actually, I've always thought that this person in this drama is autistic coded, 
feel free to message us via the Afternoon Delight uh, social media channels or Afternoon Delight podcast at gmail.com and uh, we'd be very happy to cover them. So until next time, we're just leaving you to say... Come <laughs> <laughs> Samnida. Thank you for listening to Afternoon of Delight. Where can you find us outside the pod? Head on over to afternoonadelight.com. That's A F T E R N O O N A D E L I G H T.com. You'll find links to all our social media, our book recs, K pop and K skincare recs, and if you want even more Afternoon of Delight, because really who doesn't, you can join our Patreon where you can choose the patron level that's right for you. Join in daily K-drama conversations, listen to bonus podcast episodes just for patrons, and participate in our monthly live K-drama support group via Zoom. We can't wait for you to be a part of the community. Until next time, annyeong!